Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Karen Sito, Professor of Geography and Urbanization at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Her research is on the human transformation of land and the links between urbanization, global change, and sustainability. A geographer by training, her research integrates remote sensing, field interviews, and modeling methods to study land change and urbanization, forecast urban growth, and examine the environmental consequences of urban expansion. Today we'll talk with her about urbanization, global change, and sustainability. Welcome, Professor Sito. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. So, um, the majority of your work um, focuses on China and India. Why those two places? Well, China and India, well, one third, one out of every three persons who lives in an urban area lives in either China or India. Okay. And so the magnitude of the urban demographic there is, is enormous. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening now, or the current situation, but if you look into the future over the next 20 to 30 years, both China and India will experience a really large-scale urban expansion, both in terms of the population and mm -hmm. also in terms of land development. So it represents, both of these countries really represent a large fraction of the global urban population. Okay, makes sense. So let's talk about how um, land expansions, expansion has happened in the past. Well, if you look at the classic literature, like urban economics or agricultural economics, cities expanded in the past historically because of land prices, because of a concentration of people moving into the city, because of jobs. It's very locally based. Mm -hmm. So cities expanded as part of the hinterland. But cities today, and especially cities in China and India, are expanding in a, in a very, very different way, okay. where the factors that are driving their growth are more driven are, are, are more driven from outside of the country okay. and not locally. So you have things like foreign direct investment mm -hmm. now uh, in China and in India that shapes the development of uh, housing uh, estates, residential estates. And that's really different than what happened 50 years ago or even 100 years ago. How so? Well, in the past, it was just much more local, right? Okay. And so it's not only the lo local investments, national investments. I mean, National investments still make a difference and mm -hmm. still matter, but increasingly what we see in China and India is that international investments have a really big impact. Uh, and they impact a lot of different things. They impact how people uh, live in terms of the kind of housing structure that mm -hmm. they want. Single family homes are much more uh, predominant now in China than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's something that's uh, much uh, really brought about from uh, investments from overseas, but also Chinese going overseas and saying, well, this is a kind of uh, housing that we'd like to, to have. Okay. So with the population growing, um, are you finding uh, urban areas are growing up in terms of, you know, housing is growing up in terms of, you know, sky rises, that kind of thing, as well as moving out to countryside? Well, that's an interesting question because so much of what I do is with remote sensing, and mm -hmm. with remote sensing we've been looking primarily on uh, at the expansion on the two-dimensional mm -hmm. uh, sphere. But um, recently we've been doing some work with people at the University of New Hampshire, okay. and using other types of satellites we've been able to see that cities are growing both outwards, but then also they're growing really upwards. Right. And Chinese cities especially are, are increasingly growing upwards. Mm -hmm. We don't see the same trend elsewhere, and this no, is so pretty not in India, for nope, instance. No, not as no. much. Indian uh -huh. cities are relatively low rise and and very expansive, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of different reasons for this. Some of which have to do with a lot of it have to do with zoning okay. and building regulations. Interesting. So why is it important to look at this kind of stuff? Urban expansion. Yeah. yeah well, um, it depends on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so if you talk to the private sector, they're really interested in understanding where people will live and how they will live because that shapes consumption patterns, where you're going to sell cars, where mm -hmm. Home Depot should be, or maybe Starbucks. Sure. Uh, Good old it, marketing data. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, where the next consumers will be concentrated. Right, right. Uh, if you talk to earth system scientists and climate scientists, there's a, a lot of interest in understanding how urban areas will expand because how cities grow and ha where people commute and their commuting patterns. 
affect things like uh, daily energy use through transport, the size of your house mm -hmm. uh, affects energy use, and all of that then affects greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Right. Um, another element of this is to, on a global scale, uh, and over the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to see somewhere on the order of one to two billion more people in cities. And mm -hmm. so we're going to have to build a lot of urban space to house all these people. If you think globally at the biodiversity hotspots, all the farmland in the world, you have to think, well, where will these cities develop? Mm -hmm. Will they impact and fragment biodiversity hotspots? Mm -hmm. Will they affect uh, the most productive farmlands? Um, another element of this from a more Red Cross perspective mm -hmm. or humanitarian perspective is people are moving into places that are vulnerable to hazards, sea level rise and storm surges. Right. So being able to forecast where cities will grow and how they will grow uh, will have a will be important depending on you know your, whether you're talking sure. to the private sector or, or humanitarian efforts. So what are you finding in your research? How will cities be growing? How will urbanization expand in the future? Uh, well, what we're finding is that over the last 20 years, the general trend worldwide is that of uh, reduced density. And so going into the future, I mean, if we looked historically, Mm -hmm. Cities were compact and really dense places, concentrated people and concentrated activities. But going into the future, what we're expecting to see, given the recent trends, is that these are relatively low density, expansive, commuting, car-based uh, communities, uh, that many of these new cities will be in low-lying zones. Mm -hmm. uh, hu humans like to live near the coast. Mm -hmm. We like to be uh, on the coast, and so. Now, are we still talking China and India? No, globally. Okay. So we've done a forecast globally of, of urban okay. expansion, and we're seeing this trend globally. Right. That we um, there yes, are a lot of cities likes concentrated to live by the water. Yeah, yes, <laughs> that's right, and that trend is not going to change. Okay. And uh, but at the same time, if we look at trends in climate change and and, and hurricanes and storm surges, mm -hmm. I mean, it basically means the confluence of concentrated people with increased episodes of uh, climate hazards. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your methodology for, for a minute. Um, you touched on it earlier, but how do you determine how things will grow? So a lot of this is uh, using satellite data. So okay. these are satellites that are launched by NASA. Uh -huh. They're relatively core scale data. By that I mean each pixel or each cell we're looking at is about 30 meters. Okay. So to the American crowd, that's about <laughs> yeah, <good luck. laughs> right. It's about 100 <laughs> feet, uh, 90 feet or so. Um, and uh, basically, what we're looking at is for each of these pixels, we're looking historically at how this cell has changed. Was it farmland? Was it um, was it forest? And we're able to look at historical patterns using the satellite data with historical patterns of population growth and economic growth. Mm -hmm. So we can develop these mathematical relations of population density, built up density, in order to forecast uh, where urban development uh, uh, will be in the future. Mm -hmm. So a, a little bit off topic, um, how do you get access to satellite information? So the NASA data, many, much of these data are mm -hmm. actually publicly oh, available. Really? So okay. you can uh, apply for a grant. You can buy them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these data are free. Other, others require funding. Um, and, and pretty much anyone can use these data. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk sustainability for a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of um, the growth of urbanization. When you look forward, you know, 10 years, 20 years, you know, do you grow concerned over the, the fact that, um, you know, we are encroaching on forests, for, in, in, for instance, and, and other, I would say, more environmental areas? What are you finding? What are your thoughts? Well, the, the literature in our own research is mixed on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really depends on a case-to-case -case basis. One thing that we don't, we, the scientific community, doesn't have a really good handle on right now is, what does global urbanization mean for global sustainability? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of case studies for many cities around the world, 
but we don't really have a, a really good understanding of what will happen and mm -hmm. what are the, 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 the potential impacts. Some of the potential impacts I've already mentioned in terms of impacts on forests and farmland and uh, habitat loss. Uh, certainly the effects of, on, uh, of urbanization on energy use. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's a lot of research that shows that if you concentrate people in urban areas, it actually reduces per capita energy and material use. In other words, it's much more resource efficient mm -hmm. to have people concentrated in urban areas than it is to spread them out all across the countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you think about the concrete and steel mm -hmm. fiber optics to wire everybody up if they're in low density single family homes versus in concentrated places, that's really, really mm -hmm. quite different in terms of material use. Right, right. Uh, in terms of the population growth in India and China, um, you know, how do you think that will affect urbanization in those countries? Well, what we're seeing is very different drivers of urbanization in China and India. Uh, in the popular media, we see that China and India are often talked about as, their, as though they're some monolithic, <laughs> uh, joined together type place. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they're really different. The patterns of urbanization are very different and the drivers are very different. China, during the first half of the 20th century, is, is, is primarily uh, a story of urban population growth and large-scale urban uh, infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the story of India, it's very different. Okay. Whereas the, the story of India is one where the urban population growth is really going to take place during the second half of the century. So the patterns, the spatial patterns, are also going to be very different. Mm -hmm. okay. China has a lar more large-scale uh, city development compared to what's mm -hmm. happening in India, which is much more smaller scale. Okay. Looking at the globe, um, what places do you anticipate will be growing the most or the fastest? Again, China and India, perhaps, or are there any pl other places in the world? Uh, Africa. <coughs> Africa, okay. So cities in Africa will be uh, growing pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is uh, population growth, okay. but also part of that is in, uh, the, the growth of uh, economies in, yes. in, in Africa. Things are starting to take off uh, in Africa. Any particular places in Africa, South Africa or, you know, perhaps more centrally or the East Coast? Uh, we're seeing, at least in our models, we're seeing that uh, on the uh, western coast, actually, oh, okay. in places like in Nigeria, mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot of the smaller cities really expand out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then lastly, um, in terms of, again, sustainability, um, wh what do you think that, you know, the biggest concerns are going to be moving forward mm -hmm. on a global scale in terms of urbanization? Well, I think there are two different types of sustainability questions. Mm -hmm. uh, from a more environmental perspective, some of the sustainability questions are around resource use mm -hmm. and energy. Uh, what are the resources required to build and operate? It's not just operating, but building the cities of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our most recent models suggest that over the next 20 years, we're going to have an area three times the size of Spain be developed into cities. So wow. that's a huge that's amount huge. of resources. And in terms of operating those cities, those cities are going to need a lot of resources and energy to, to maintain them. So on the environmental side, there are big questions around resource and material use. I think on the social side, there are really big questions and uncertainties around the social sustainability of cities. Mm -hmm. There are many cities in China and India where traffic congestion, pollution, uh, a lack of social cohesion, uh, violence uh, are really big issues. Mm -hmm. And it's unclear how these cities will continue to evolve over the next 20 to 30 years. Not just those in China, but ones in Africa as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is, I think, a, a, another issue in terms of thinking about sustainability of cities mm -hmm. and of urbanization. Do you have any um, words of wisdom, perhaps, or any cautionary um, words for places that will be growing in terms of what to do or what not to do perhaps? Uh, well it's always easier to come up with what not to do mm -hmm. than what you should do okay. um, and and one of the things that we've learned is that the the cities or the urbanizing places that are the 
the most functioning, both environmentally and socially, are ones that developed because, or developed in a way because their leaders had a vision, mm -hmm. had a vision of what that place could be, as opposed to really thinking very, very short term. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's clear from the research that cities are sites of innovation. They're places that are very creative but that doesn't happen spontaneously. Right. And, and that there are certain elements of the, uh, of the city that can nurture this or can become obstacles. Mm -hmm. And so a large challenge, I think, going to the future is uh, to think about a vision for a place and uh, to have the resources to bring those pieces together to meet, to, mm -hmm. to really, uh, to, to achieve that vision. Good, proper planning. Well, you know, interestingly enough, not always. Really? N really. So um, planning, I think there are many examples where planning has actually failed. Uh, okay. so too much planning. Uh, part of what makes exciting cities exciting is that, that element of chaos, mm -hmm. that element of uncertainty. I mean, if you think about the cities that you like going to, mm -hmm. I would imagine that your favorite cities include having you where you can walk around and mm -hmm. discover, right. get, discover new restaurants or coffee shops. Sometimes the most well-planned places are too punctual, too everything in an order. I see, right, right. Yeah, um, I can think of a couple of examples, you know, pro-planning and then not um, pro-planning. Um, you know, the city I grew up in, for instance, I, when I think about the city, I say, wow, People could have planned this so much better. <laughs> but I guess yes. to your point, yep. sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a matter of finding that right balance mm -hmm. of top down and bottom up. Right. Yes, well, that's hard to come mm -hmm. by, unfortunately, I think sometimes. Oh. Yeah, well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. For more information about Professor Cito and her research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.